but it's kind of in that ballpark. Okay, here we have a piece of contemporary quote high unquote technology, the thumb drive, which has been disguised as a piece of sushi. Okay, this is not doing the same sort of social commentary that Robita was attempting to do. What I liked about this image and the reason I took this picture is that it was described as Japanese traditional USB memory. It was the word traditional that sort of broke it into an atemporal space. If it had simply been called USB memory shaped like a shrimp, okay, you know, it would be in a kind of interesting kid toy kind of space. But to have it be Japanese traditional USB sushi memory, actually like, I mean, it's not like a Babylonian disc. We're not going to like look at it with a kind of holy awe, you know. I mean, it's not a super impressive thing. It's not like Da Vinci's weird insides or, the, or, or you know, this sort of, untamable alo pile. It's really kind of a, a pop thing. But nevertheless, it, like, it does mess with your head in an atemporal fashion. Right? It's like, why traditional? I took this picture in Turin about a year ago now. Okay, here you have, you know, what's basically a lace antimacassar, a doily, kind of old-fashioned piece of, you know, household accoutrement, the kind of thing your, you know, maiden aunt might have. And yet, it's been sort of virtualized, right? I mean, you're taking an image which is present in a computer grain video screen, outputting it as a knitted object, but a particularly archaic, knitted object, and then you have this little border around the side which adds it to it, this, this, this extra bit of ladylike refinement that actually shows that it isn't merely a fabric printout of a screen, it's actually meant to bewilder us, right? I mean, it's, 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 there's, there's a, the designer of this object he hasn't merely done something, she, it's almost certainly a woman, she hasn't merely done something which surprises us by its transition from the virtual to the actual. She's taken a certain form of social performance, which is associated with, you know, computer interfaces, the high tech, and moved it into a different area of social interpretation, which is associated with, like, having hair oil and keeping it off the back of a seat, right? So this is a design stunt. And, and, and you can see it's quite an expensive item. I mean, 29 euros, it's actually pretty upscale. Uh, they sold out like hotcakes. I mean, I went back the next day because as soon as I put this on my Flickr set, five or six people jumped on it, demanding that I go buy them one instead of offering anything I wanted. And they had already all been bought. So, you know, I think you could describe this as a kind of design whimsy. It's not strictly atemporal because a lot of its impact actually comes from this unexpected segue between virtual and actual, but there's also a deliberate archaism happening here. It's a segue from the modern into the old fashioned. Okay, this is not the same kind of atemporality as the others, but I believe it's in the same ballpark. This is a Fiat concept car from 1954, which was the, uh, the year of my birth. And you can see that it's not merely a model of a car, but there was also a, there's also a photograph of the concept car that was built from the model, so that it was an actual working vehicle. I mean, not put into mass production, but you know, presumably shipped around Italy sometime in the 50s and shown off to people as an exemplar of a supposedly futuristic fiat car which actually never really existed. I mean, it was kind of deliberate corporate head fake at futuristic thinking, except that it was particularly well embodied because, you know, to build a car is actually quite difficult. So, what is this thing? I mean, it was futuristic at the time. It's now archaic. I mean, it's, it's pretty old. It's going to get even more old, older. Um, it's antique futurism. 
It's a prototype, but it's not a prototype of anything in particular. It's a prototype of a, quote, advance, unquote, that did not really go anywhere. You know, it's not like Leonardo in the sense that it's a thing that does not work, because you could make a car like this. It wouldn't be that difficult. And you see that somebody actually did make a car, which looked pretty much like this model. OK, so what's more atemporal? Is the model the atemporal part, or is the actual car the atemporal part? Or what would be really superbly atemporal would be to get the plans for the car, rebuild the car now, and then drive a modern version of a remake of this non-existent car around in public. I mean, that would be a truly atemporal gesture to be in a brand new, ancient, antique, futurist car. You would actually break something by doing that. You know, it would be sort of hyper atemporal. It's not that we don't have enough words for doing this. We probably have too many. I'm kind of looking for a simpler formulation that would describe what a stunt like that would be. <clears throat> This is from a recent Memphis show in Milan at the Furniture Fair, Memphis, very well known designers of the 1980s. Okay, this is not precisely atemporal in the way that I was previously describing. I think this is probably best described as outside the box. Here you have some guys who are basically from the Italian radical architects movement of the 70s, who then moved into product design and these are, you know, vases and teapots. Okay, vases and teapots never looked like that before. And vases and teapots are never going to look like that again. But they sort of have no precursors as Memphis vases and teapots. And they have sort of no inheritors as Memphis vases and teapots. You know, it's not that they threaten us or that they frighten us. It's more that the people who were thinking about this were deliberately kind of shattering our expectations about the way these common objects behave and then building them as a kind of concept proof of where their heads were at. And their heads were in a very strange place for a rather short time. This is not an avant-garde. They were not breaking new ground and having a lot of people following them. It's more of a departure. They're just radically different. And these are not futuristic objects. It's not that they're saying, OK, from now on, all teapots are going to be like this. They're not trying to convince us that this is a prototype for the way everybody's teapot is going to look. It's more like a deliberate effort to put teapots into a previously impossible space and then sort of release them. They're otherworldly. They're alien to our expectations. They're not very functional. Form's not following function here. They're not any better. They don't pour tea any better. A lot of people call Memphis whimsical. I think Memphis can be called whimsical. I think Memphis also has some threatening elements. I think there's sort of an undercurrent of dread to this stuff, especially when you see it in, in person. It really has, I mean, it has bright, kind of attractive 80s MTV style colors, but it also has, it also has an element of threat. Here we have antique science fiction objects. This is not futurism. It's not that these objects were produced with the expectation that everybody would have a ray gun. These objects were produced so that children could play with ray guns. This is museum piece popular fantasy. Museum piece science fantasy. It's kid junk. If you look at one of these objects, they're very badly made, made in Hong Kong.